Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 Podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts and anywhere else you listen to podcasts, we're not just we're not just exclusive to <laughs> Apple. I realise that I've only ever said on Apple Podcasts, but anywhere you listen to podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever it is you get your podcasts, if you could rate and review us, we would very, very, very much appreciate that. It is a huge amount for the exposure of the show, and thank you so much to anyone that's already done that for us. You're an absolute legend to us. Thank you. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, loving the pregnant pauses these days, aren't you? <laughs> Mr. Lewis Camley, how's it going, Lewis? It's going well, Mark. I'm always waiting for you to like change my name or something. <laughs> like I'm waiting for some dodgy <laughs> intro. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. It's been a tiring few days at work. But when isn't it? It's, yeah, when that's, isn't it, That's work for you. <laughs> Absolutely. So what have you been playing? I've actually mainly just been playing our play-along game for this month, which we're discussing later, which of course is Kentucky Route Zero. So I'm going to save all thoughts and reflections yeah. for that discussion later God in the show. Me. I have some thoughts. Well, yeah, we better rattle along and get there fast because I've got some damn thoughts too. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, beyond that, just a, a tiny little bit of Katana Zero. I'm dying. I'm actually dying to get back to Star Wars. I've been thinking about it a lot because it's so different to what Kentucky Route Zero is as a, as a game. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. So it's, now that I'm kind of out of the way of that, I'm going to jump straight back in and hopefully get that finished. Cool, man. Nice one. What have you been playing? I have basically only been playing Card of Darkness. <laughs> yes. The mobile game that you recommended to me, Lewis. And in actual fact, I have surpassed your progress and completed it. You have indeed, yeah. It was really good. I was shocked at how much I liked it. Again, it is a easy concept to grasp and a very difficult concept to master. And the systems in place get surprisingly complex surprisingly quickly. But at the same time, it all seems very intuitive. It's a fantastic bit of game design, actually. It really is superb. And if anyone's got Apple Arcade, I'd really recommend that you go and try it. It's, it's really, really great. But apart from that, Lewis, I have actually strategically taken a break and not played any video games. Oh my God. I know. What do you mean by that? <laughs> exactly. Well, and for someone who has a, a podcast that is talking about video games, that is a, that is a bold thing to do. It However, <laughs> I don't think you had anything else that you did. <laughs> I do other things. Well, basically, see if you think back to last year, going all the way back to Control. Like I, I played Control, I played Ori, I played Link's Awakening, I played The Outer Worlds, I played Pokemon, I played Star Wars, I played Death Stranding, then into this year, I was immediately into The Last of Us, and then Doom, and then Kentucky Route Zero, and the other play-along games that we were playing along that time mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And we're just about to go into Ori again, Doom again, Resident Evil 3, Final Fantasy 7 Remake, then it's... Uh, the Last of Us 2 and I'm going to try and play Trials of Mana in there somewhere and really? I've just bought Persona 5 so I'm just like do you know what C4 this week I'm just going to chill out I'm not going to play any video games I'm going to get re-energised for it and I'm going to come back swinging because I'm going to need if I'm going to play all those games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough, man. I think that's really good. I, I often have th thought that you're so focused on that list of games that you want to get through. And uh, like, I just can't keep up with that, to be honest, like the way that I live my life. So it's nice to know that you've sort of taken a step back and, and chilled yeah. out from it. But I mean, I'm totally psychopathic about it, obviously, yeah. but I, I know my limits. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but just also, I think that's a really good thing for it, for any gamers out there to, if you've, if you've not got something that you really need to play or that you really want to be part of that conversation, it's totally fine just to not play games yeah. for a couple of Days. absolutely that's kind of why i wanted yeah. to bring this up it is okay to take a break every now and again i am definitely wanting to play a lot of these games coming up i am very much going to be balls to the wall playing a lot of these games yeah. soon to try and get <laughs> through them but i don't know like i feel as if i feel as if you can i feel as if you can make games feel like a grind mm -hmm. that you're like oh i need to go back and play doom say because i need to get through that because then final fantasy 7 is coming up and i need to finish that by the time final fantasy comes out because that's going to take up all my time and i don't want to have to be playing them both concurrently and whatever and i am going to be doing that like i am definitely definitely going to be doing that so i just think for now just let's have a wee break from that just let's get excited about all the games that we're going to be coming up and playing and yeah i'm looking forward to stuff now nice good so do you know what game you are going to come back to when you do come back? I think I'm going to get stuck into Pokemon again. It's, it's been quite a while, actually, since I've properly sat down and played it for any length of time. And it's been out for ages now. It's just that a whole bunch of other stuff kind of got in the way of me playing it. 
it's very low intensity. I don't have to think about it too much. It's just colourful characters and <laughs> stupid little songs and whatever. And, I, and I'm very much in the mood for that before I get into Doom Eternal. Basically, will be the next major one, the next new release yeah. that I will be getting into. And then, as I said, after that, Resident Evil 2, sorry, Resident Evil 3 remake is not long after that at all. Then not long after that, it's Final Fantasy 7. And then it just gets worse and worse. And <laughs> <laughs> Until after The Last of Us. And then for now, there's a wee bit of a break. And then after that, I mean, the back end of this year is going to be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's so far away, Liz. It's now time for the news. All right, and news item number one. GDC Lewis has been postponed following an exodus of attendees due to the coronavirus outbreak. So since we last spoke about this last week, Microsoft had pulled out, Unity had pulled out, Epic Games had pulled out, Amazon had pulled out, Activision Blizzard had pulled out. Then GDC made some ridiculous statement about the severity of the coronavirus, which is severe, mm. by the way, in case there was any anyone thinking otherwise. Um, but basically their hand was forced and they had they had to do something and they had to postpone because there was basically going to be no one there. Um, so in the end, uh, GDC postponed the event and they made this statement. After close consultation with our partners in the game development industry and community around the world, we've made the difficult decision to postpone the Game Developers Conference this March. Having spent the past year preparing for the show with our advisory boards, speakers, exhibitors and event partners, we're genuinely upset and disappointed not to be able to host you at this time. We want to thank all our customers and partners for their support, open discussions and encouragement. As everyone has been reminding us, great things happen when the community comes together and connects at GDC. For this reason, we fully intend to host a GDC event later in the summer. We will be working with our partners to finalise the details and we'll share more information about our plans in the coming weeks. And I feel that's genuine. I feel that they probably are genuinely gutted oh, that, absolutely, that yeah. this has happened. And I'm gutted for them as well, because mm. GDC was a good event. Of course, it was aimed at developers, but it, it was a great event. There was usually some pretty interesting stuff that came out. But in fact, last year, it was uh, the Stadia announcement, exactly, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, some big things come out of GDC. And it's a very good thing for the industry as well, for those for those developers to network and whatever and have meetings with yeah. big companies. But unfortunately, the financial impact of this will be a pretty big deal for GDC themselves. But also a lot of smaller developers will have really struggled to take this financial hit. As such, several relief funds have actually been started up to help out smaller developers and developers who will have lost so much money not going to this now that they might very well fold. So it's, it's good to see that. It's good to see like the community coming together to try Absolutely, and yeah. sort one another out in, in the face of what is a really shitty situation, you know? However, it has been confirmed that the price of the passes will be refunded to everyone and if you booked a hotel through GDC, you won't have to pay any penalties on your cancellation, although ultimately I think that money's probably gone. Mm. So, GDC are currently saying that this is postponed. Do you actually think that this event materialises later on the year? I think it's interesting that they say a GDC event rather than an exact replica of GDC that they were going to do. So I wouldn't be stunned if they do something, but maybe not on the full scale of what they would ordinarily do. I think even Microsoft have said that they're still going to do streams and stuff like that that week. I think there's a lot of other alternative mm -hmm. events being set up yeah. and a lot of people who were going to speak at GDC have been invited to alternative mm -hmm. events. Yeah. And I know that some people are doing stuff on Twitch and a lot of the messages that we would have been getting from GDC are still going to be out there. Exactly, yeah. Um, it's just unfortunate that event itself isn't going to take place. Yeah, that's the thing. So it really does impact those small developers, those people that are maybe looking for jobs in the industry and that kind of thing that are that are really losing out more so than, than kind of us, the fans, or whatever. So, yeah, it's a, it's a terrible shame in terms of whether this can happen in the summer. I mean, who can say right now? I mean, they can't possibly say right now. There is no. talk that events, you know, major events, the Olympics, are under threat, you know, if this continues, if this situation Certainly. continues to grow. Well, the next thing in gaming, in the crosshairs, is definitely E3 now. Yeah. I mean, surely yeah they have to be thinking about yeah. this and they have to have some sort of plan in place for the event not going ahead mm -hmm. the thing about gdc is is that i kind of feel that gdc will be fine ultimately like there's still a desire to have the game developers conference still very well attended by people in the industry whereas e3 is not in a great state yep. just now and i worry about e3 like if e3 doesn't go ahead this year does it come back in the form that we all know it is it just a much smaller scale thing i don't know it feels like another nail in the coffin for yeah. them, you know what i mean which is it's really horrible because this is totally totally out with anyone's control you know 
yeah, it's just really sad. Again, I know that this is very trivial to talk about the impact of this on the video games industry when literally thousands of people have died and the situation is only getting worse, quite mm. frankly. Um, the first case in Scotland was actually just, what, a couple of days ago? A couple ago, of days then? ago, yeah, in, in Tayside, yeah. Yeah, and I think we're up to, what, 50 odds in I, the UK? I think approaching that. Last I saw it was like high 30s, but that was a couple of days ago. So Yeah, yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure we're yeah. over 50 now. I'm sure I read it today. So, yeah, I mean, it's a serious situation. Everyone look after themselves. Wash your hands. Wash your hands, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, seriously. Stop uh, talking to other people. Stop <laughs> talking to other people. Um, yeah, look after yourselves. Yeah. All right, news item number two. There is a lot happening at Platinum Games, Lewis. There is a hell of a lot happening with Platinum Games. They promised us more announcements, and they have delivered. <laughs> they certainly have delivered. Um, so a few weeks ago, Platinum announced that they were kickstarting a Wonderful 101 remake with the humble goal of 50 grand. That Kickstarter is now nearly at two million so way, way, over, way over and above <laughs> that game's gonna happen <laughs> way, way over and above what they needed and it's going to happen sooner or less because they've now announced that the release date for north america will be may the 19th for europe it will be may the 22nd and for japan it will be june the 11th um, and it will be available on the switch it'll be available on the playstation 4 and it'll be available on the pc platinum have also announced that they will be opening a new studio in tokyo this is to expand into new genres and styles of play, quotes apparently, um, that from executive vice president and studio head at Sushi Inaba. It seems that the genres that they are interested in moving into are live service genres, which is something, hmm. maybe we'll talk about that in a second, but it's maybe not something I particularly want from <laughs> Platinum Games. But nonetheless, that's where they want to go. And is also enabling them to self-publish, and that is very much where it looks as if they want to go, which is, which is great. I mean, I mean, good on them. Inaba made this statement on the Platinum Games website. So far, the name Platinum Games has been nearly synonymous with single-player action games, but going forward, we're looking to expand into new genres and styles of play. One of these new challenges for us is console live ops game development. These aren't games we'd work on until they were done, and that's all. Rather, we'd continue working on them to provide new content long after release. We want to explore this ongoing development pattern in the home console space. So what was he calling them? Live ops games? Live ops game development. Right, okay. <laughs> Which, it's a live service Yeah, game. I think it's, that's it's live service. <laughs> to the likes of you and I, that's what we would say. <laughs> also, not finished with the announcements, they have teased a new game, which is currently called Project GG. This will be the third game in director Hidahi Kamaya's superhero trilogy after The Wonderful 101 and Beautiful Joe. Um, it looks very, very Pacific Rim. Yeah. Very Pacific Absolutely. Rim. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's clearly a mechs versus monsters game. The trailer looked really cool. It's a, sh- I thought, a strange um, thing, that yeah, trailer. Yeah, we'll put a link to it on uh, players2.com. I, I thought it was looked wild. Yeah, <laughs> it looked like the actual, the kind of scene that we were given was beautifully done, I thought, and yeah, it looked really interesting. But then not, all the not, titles I'll, and stuff over it were completely bizarre. Oh, yeah. Tonally all over the shop, but yeah. quite fun still. The actual art style of it, not Platinum Games no, at all. No, no, very uh, real. Well, I certainly associate Platinum Games with a very sort of anime, mm. very Japanese art style. That wasn't like that at no. all, I never thought. Yeah, I thought it looked great. I thought it looked really, really cool. Very, very excited to see what that turns out to be. Just onto the self-publishing, very briefly. How cool is that? I'm so happy for this studio, by the way. I, I think that Platinum Games have made some absolutely incredible incredible games over the years, uh, not least of which was Nier Automata, which is one of my favourite games ever. Um, and the Bayonetta series, which I think is, as far as those kind of action games go, is for me the pinnacle, bar none. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just so happy for it. Yeah. I, I just think that that's so awesome, and I think more smaller studios should maybe look to do this. Yep. It is amazing that they've taken this leap. I know that that's probably a huge risk for them, but amazing, just amazing that they're going for it. That's totally it. Like the fact that they got the money that they were looking for to remaster and then publish uh, the wonderful 101 well apparently sh- apparently the kickstarter wasn't about the money apparently it was just to gauge interest yeah, and yeah. then they got two million dollars <laughs> and they're like so- we'll release it in six weeks time <laughs> but then yeah the, the fact that they can i think they've also kind of made reference to the fact that people quite often say to them like oh i wish you would make a sequel to this game or that game you know near automata pr- probably being one of them and it's not in their control basically and so no, this not- finally will put some at least some of their ip if not you know going forward maybe more of their ip yeah. uh, in their own hands and that's like i barely play any platinum games it's not really my style both in terms of gameplay and in the look as you were describing there but i i agree like i think this is really good for them all right and news item number three is kojima productions teasing a new silent hill game question mark <laughs> said every single clickbaity title in the world this week um 
Oh, God, this is the worst. I really hate this news story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start with what we know, Lewis. We know that Konami is, quotes considering ways to provide the next title in the Silent Hill series. We know that Kojima has said that his studio is planning to work on multiple game projects, uh, one of which will be a, quotes big game. However, the world absolutely caught fire this week when Kojima Productions' head of communications... Aki Sayato tweeted this. Sorry to be silent, everyone. I've been really busy lately. I think I can say more soon about what we're going to do. Dot, dot, dot. Now, this was accompanied by a picture of Sayato on the phone holding a pyramid branded pencil and having written the words next week on a post-it. And he also said silent in his comment. Yeah. Sorry to be silent, everyone. So therefore, the next Silent well, Hell game is imminent. It, it must be, right? This is it absolutely nonsense. Must be. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a, another key bit of information that you left out there, which is that we also know that <sighs> K- uh, Kojima, for a while now, has been talking about working on an extremely uh, scary that's game. True. That is true. Uh, See if this turns out to... I, I will be pissed off if this turns out to be true. As much as I think a new Silent Hill game made by Kojima would be fucking incredible, just because of this, I will be so annoyed if this is true. I mean, this is the most ridiculous way to tease this. <laughs> it is... Ri- ah! I totally agree with that. I mean, we, we sort of off air, we were joking about this because... What? other industry analyzes <laughs> tweets to this degree it is madness this, you wouldn't have a podcast if we weren't analyzing oh tweets to God this degree I, God, no, I, hate it so I mean much. yeah i kind of jokingly called this a few weeks ago and i do think that there could be something in this idea that maybe the hatchet has been buried between kojima and konami and that maybe the silent hill game because they know that with the the success of pt the fact that people are still remaking pt in dreams what five years later there is a demand for that specific game not just the silent hill game but that that Silent Hill game. I could see it happening, but obviously I don't genuinely read all that much into these tweets. The fact that he has a pyramid branded pencil, I mean, who even could have known that? So I don't know. I don't read anything. Someone that, zoomed in <laughs> real quick. But you do think if you were Kojima Productions and you're part of their like media and PR team, you'd be like, there's pretty much one word we can't ever tweet, and that word is silent, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that you can even tell by the syntax of the sentences that it's been translated from japanese as well so that silent could have been saying like oh we've been quiet but Mm -hmm. it's just it just happens to have translated from japanese as silent more directly than being quiet you know what i mean why do you hate excitement mark i don't i love (laughs) hype i just hate bullshit like this (laughs) well the one thing that is probably true about this tweet is the fact that he's written next week on a Mm post-it meaning this week now yeah do we think that we get an announcement from kojima productions then do we think we get anything even if it isn't a silent hill game i mean if it isn't a silent hill game then it's i mean kojima's horror game is it just more death stranding chat you know they do have the pc release coming so well the pc release is coming out on june the second it has just been announced and there will be a weird crossover with half-life apparently um obviously because (laughs) half-life alex is also coming out soon so yeah maybe it is just more pc stuff in actual fact this has got nothing to do with anything yeah but my god to watch <laughs> the games media explode over this was just absolutely wild or just the twitter sphere explode over this was just insane i could not believe it <laughs> yeah. like, i could not believe how seriously people were taking the brand <laughs> of a pencil that i've never heard of i mean when you say it like that it sounds mental <laughs> It's got to be true. See if this turns out to be true. <laughs> I know what's going to happen is that this is going to be announced tomorrow while I'm editing this podcast, yeah. while I'm editing me lose my mind about how this could not possibly be true. And it's going to be announced that Kojima's making a new Silent Hill game and I'm going to look like a fool. <laughs> All right. News item number four. Indie developers and publishers are saying that Google isn't offering them enough money or any real incentive to put their games on Stadia. This comes from a report from Business Insider. Um, Links, as always, in the show notes at players2.com. Speaking anonymously, one publishing executive said that Google's offer to them was so low it wasn't even part of the conversation. Which, I mean, come on, you're Google. (laughs) (laughs) This is insane. And some had, in fact, said that it wasn't just about the money, although it was also about the money. But they'd also expressed concern that Google's track record of shutting down services that hadn't gone well. And I think we can all safely say at this stage, Stadia has not gone well. And they were also expressing concern about the lack of audience um, that Stadia actually has and whether or not it was worth them developing for Stadia in the first place. One other game developer told Business Insider this... 
it wasn't just a financial thing. At the end of the day, I'm asking the question, why would I do this? And there was no positive reason to move forward. There wasn't really anything to want us to get in the door other than to be first on the platform. Stadia has promised 120 new games coming to its platform this year, although there have been no further details on that since they announced it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it is absolutely unbelievable that the problem with Google Stadia is that Google aren't offering enough money. That's Google's one thing, yeah. that they've got all the money. It, oh my God, they, they fucked us up so badly. I mean, they, they also, surely... did you know how many titles are actually available on Stadia to play right now? I mean, it must be under 50, right? Like, Have a guess. I'll go 38. 28. Is that all this? Oh my god. I see, I, th- I thought I had it in my head that they'd added a few extra, like, after the uproar, that's but that was of, probably that's the as extra. Of, that's as of that article being released, which came out on March the 1st. So as of March the 1st, there were 28 games available on Stadia. It's been out for, what, three months now? In yeah. fact, the subscription period, the initial subscription yeah, period must be over now. So yeah, it's been out for over three months. It's mad to think that... There's 28 games on it. That- do you remember when <laughs> Switch came out? Sorry, sorry, <laughs> no, I, sorry no, no, I feel no, like no, I'm no. talking over here, but do you remember when Switch came out? And I think it was every every Thursday, there was this deluge mm-hmm. of games that yeah. were now available on the Nintendo eShop. That is what Google Stadia should be yeah. doing. Why Why isn't there every other day, oh, there's a list as long as your arm of games that are now available on Stadia? I just don't understand how they could possibly have mucked this up this badly. It's insane. It's, it's it, absolutely it's insane. totally insane. I cannot believe of all the things, of all the things that could have been the problem with Google Stadia and getting people onto their platform, money is the problem. Because yeah. they have... More money than God. Yeah. They are, they, they, are, they are one of the richest companies in the world ever. Like, one of the top three anyway. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah like, unbelievable. I think this it says everything about what's gone wrong with Stadia. I mean, it's interesting that the NVIDIA GeForce now has probably had more games pulled from it than Stadia actually <laughs> has altogether. Oh my God, that, that would be an amazing thing to figure out. Um, I'm totally going to look that up. <laughs> it strikes me that basically this is an example of Google being a huge company who have paid no attention to the inner workings of the game kind of biosphere, how things work in this industry, what people expect, what developers expect, what gamers expect. They've just kind of come along going, we've got this technology and everyone kind of thought technology will probably be fine. And I guess some developers and publishers got on board with that, but they've not backed up with anything. They've not come up with the kind of deals that Microsoft and Sony have had to make and Steam and probably Epic have had to make with developers and publishers to get the bloody games on the system. That's what you need. Obviously all those systems have a big audience though as well do you know what i mean even like of the three that you just mentioned there like xbox has the smallest audience but it's still magnitudes bigger than what stadia has yeah. to make them go to the bother of putting it on your system they have to be reasonably compensated for that and to say that their offers were so low they were basically out, completely out with any consideration yeah. whatsoever that is ridiculous the hubris the, the sheer arrogance mm-hmm. of google just to think that developers would be falling over themselves to get on their system is honestly i i i cannot believe how badly this has went <laughs> i thought that it might have went badly to begin with but to be at this point now for subscriptions to have lapsed and i reckon a lot of them have and there's still to be 28 games only available on that system for people that paid 130 quid, it's just... It's, 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 not, it's not good enough. It's outrageous, yeah, quite frankly. Yeah, it's it, absolutely outrageous. It definitely is. All right, and finishing off, as we always do, with a couple of shout-outs. First of all, first podcast of the month, list, and that means free games. We love free games here, Lewis. On your Xbox Games with Gold, you can get Batman, the enemy within, that is the Telltale game, Shanty, the half-genie hero, which I've literally never heard of, <laughs> and Lois was struggling to keep back his I can't can even find it on Google for five minutes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and then on your Xbox backwards compatibility, you can get Castlevania, Lords of the Shadow 2, and Sonic Generations. And on PlayStation Plus, you can get Shadow of the Colossus Remake and Sonic Forces. If you've got a PS4 and you've not downloaded the Shadow of the Colossus remake, you are seriously, seriously missing out. The Shadow of the Colossus is easily in mine and Lewis's top 10 games ever. Pretty top much, five, yeah. maybe. And, and, and as a remake, it is absolutely stunning oh, as well. Oh, remarkable, so well done. remarkable remake. Um, that was... That was, uh, that was Blue Point. Blue yeah. Point, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely superb remake. Really, really good. All right, shout out number two. No less than three Half-Life Alex gameplay trailers have been dropped loose. And I've watched them all. 
God, it's impressive. It very much is it impressive. Really it really is very, <laughs> very impressive. The way that you interact with objects in the world dynamically, like even the the daft head crab things mm-hmm. that w- when they're dead, you can like nudge them with your gun yep. away, away from stuff. It's, it's amazing. And then at one point, they just picked up a bucket and then just put it on top of um, like a wee bit of metal that was just hanging off the wall. And I was just like, that shouldn't be remarkable to me, but because it's in VR and a video game, I'm like, oh my god, that's yeah. insane. <laughs> it just makes the whole world that you're in feel so much more tactical and so much more oh, real when, when you can absolutely, do things like that yeah. so I think the, it was three trailers they're all really short they're only like f- between two and four minutes each so in total it's only about ten minutes but each one shows off a slightly different thing about how you move within the game so there's teleportation or there's this kind of thing that they're calling continuous motion and then there's also this slidey mechanic so it's different ways of navigating in VR which is obviously what makes most people feel really sick yeah. so they're showing you that so the teleport thing was quite interesting wasn't it so you yeah. could place a marker just within your field of vision yeah. and then you would effectively just teleport yeah, you, you would just be, be in there, that location which made it really like this scene that you see in the trailer it shows you really like interesting like tactical stealthy gameplay because you're moving yourself around based on where the enemies are and getting undercover and that kind of thing but then the third trailer shows you this kind of hybrid of continuous movement and teleportation which it kind of looks on screen like you're kind of sliding effectively and that all takes place in a kind of gunfight in the trailer yeah so this and was, this was combat great yeah. it looks so crazy there was also a part of that trailer where you were hiding behind a car and someone effectively flanked you and then you pulled the car door open to provide yourself more cover yep. and I just thought that is that is a beautiful beautiful touch yep. that yeah. is really really go cool. and check it out like if you, even if you've no interest in Half-Life Alex, particularly like watch these trailers to see what VR is capable of it's really impressive do you know how good this looked Lewis is that I looked up the price of <laughs> VR headsets wow, there you go <laughs> that is that is how good this looked it was it was very very impressive it was very impressive indeed all right, shout out number three. There has been a sort of new teaser for the next installment in Supermassive's Dark Pictures Anthology. Um, however, most of the trailer, it seems, was actually at the end of the previous installment, which was The Man of Medan, uh, which came out last year. Is that right? Tail end of last year, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there was also only a vague 2020 release date um, given for the next installment, which. I don't know. I was expecting sort of to be knew more, that you know. anyway. Yeah, because they yeah. they originally said that this they would be releasing a part of the Dark Pictures anthology roughly every six months. So I've just checked it out. It came out on the thirtieth of August, Man of Medan. So yeah, we're yeah. we're effectively due it now. So to only say twenty twenty yeah, makes it feel makes like me... maybe it's been pushed a little bit. Exactly, but. exactly. So you were you were relatively interested in this. You liked Until Dawn, which yeah. was Supermassive's last. Yeah, kind of big proper game. Yeah, Yeah, I I really liked Until Dawn. I bounced off it just before the end, but it's, you know, what it's doing is really clever. It's good fun to play, even if you're not that into uh, horror games. It's just, yeah, it's a really interesting kind of play on slasher games, slasher movies even. And uh, yeah, I was was thinking me and you should play them at some point. I would really love to jump into the dark pictures as well. I love that they're all co-op or all multiplayer at least, and they aren't connected stories, so you can kind of pick them up and drop them as you go. But Man of Medan got a kind of a mixed reaction, hoping this one's yeah. going to be a little bit better and takes us back closer to what Until Dawn was. All right, shout out number four. In a financial briefing, Square Enix president Yosuke Matsuda confirmed their new games will be available on current and next gen consoles. Matsuda made this statement. The next generation consoles will have backward compatibility, so we plan for the time being to make our new titles available for both current and next generation consoles. It will therefore be somewhat further down the road that we release titles exclusively for the next generation consoles. So I think that's very interesting, because obviously with what we were talking about last week with Xbox and the Series X and what they're going to be doing with their, quote, smart delivery system... I wonder if this is a sign that maybe PlayStation are going to be doing a similar thing, although... To be honest with you, that statement doesn't say that. No. But it sounds as though going forward, these publishers are going to be expecting their games that are for the previous generation of consoles to work perfectly fine on the new generation yeah. of consoles. What that also doesn't say, though, is whether or not they're going to have that same sort of thing that, well, that Microsoft suggested Smart Delivery could do and that CD Projekt Red said that they would be doing with Cyberpunk, which they both made clear that there are two separate versions of the game 
and that one is just kind of the Series X version and one's the Xbox One X version or whatever. And Square haven't said that here. They've said that the consoles are backward compatible, which might just mean that you can just play your old game on so, the new so, system. So there won't be a Final Fantasy VII remake up for the PS5. It will just be the same Final Fantasy VII remake that you're playing on the PS4. It will just be also available. Yeah, on you'll, you'll just be able to still play it there. Yeah. Do you think you'll have to buy it twice? Not if it's that version, no. I'm still not convinced that if they do do the upraised version that I think that people might charge for that, although they definitely shouldn't and there'll be a lot of pressure on them not to. If it's just that your old game, like your PS4 disc or your PS4 download can transfer, then I don't think there'll, there'll be any charge for that. Surely, surely. Well, <laughs> you'd like to hope so. Yeah. You'd like to hope so. In Xbox's world, no one would be doing that. No. But I'm still a bit unconvinced, to be honest yeah. with you, about uh, what PlayStation's going to do. Definitely. All right, and shout out number five. And speaking of Final Fantasy VII Remake, Lewis, completely out of the blue and in a tweet, Square Enix have dropped a free-to-play demo of Final Fantasy VII Remake and Mark lost his shit a little bit. (laughs) Any reaction I've seen to this has basically been universally positive. I have not read a bad word to be said about this um, demo. I am very, very excited to play it. For various reasons, I've been unable to play it, which has been very frustrating (laughs) to me, but I am so happy that I can finally get my hands on it, even if it is just a little demo. This is how I felt about the Resident Evil 2 remake when that came out last year. Just being able to get my hands on that game and experience the remake, it just got me so, so excited for eventually being able to purchase the full game. And I think that this is going to do exactly the same thing. Thoughts? Exactly the same, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. This, I guess for me particularly, this will be make or break for the game. I'm, I am excited to play it. I did start playing the original in order to kind of be better versed about it because I'd never played the original. And so playing this demo, if I enjoy it at all, then I'm, I think I'm going to be totally sold. Or if I'm, for some reason, can't imagine why I'm totally put off, then it might actually be to the game's detriment. But I would rather know. I really, really believe in demos. We grew up in demo culture. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, we bought, the official PlayStation magazine yeah. demo. Demos. I used to have a stack as tall as I was. <laughs> exactly. So every month you would have this a whole selection of games to try before you had to pay the full money for them. I really hate that that's gone. And so it's great that uh, Square have done it with this. As you mentioned, it's great that Capcom did it for Resident Evil 2 Remake. We're getting the same for Resident Evil 3 Remake. Absolutely. absolutely. So yeah, I'm it's, great, it's great to see it coming back. I've, I've got to admit, it's been, it's been lost for a long, long period of time. Mm-hmm. I understand why it might not be beneficial for a lot of people to do demos, but it's it's nice to see it when they definitely. do do it. Yeah. You know, yep. definitely nice to see it. All right, Lewis, and with that, time for a beer, and we are back with topic of the week. Topic of the week this week is our play along of Kentucky Route Zero. I mean, where do you even start? <laughs> It was quite something. So Kentucky Route Zero, if you don't know, is allegedly a point-and-click adventure game. It was initially kick-started back in 2011. The first act came out in 2013, and the last act only came out in January 2020. So it was seven years in the making. And considering how short the game is, you may be wondering, what took them so long? (laughs) And when you see the graphics and how polygonal they are and how low-res they are, you might be wondering... What took them so long? And then you realise there is so much writing in this game, it is unbelievable. (laughs) A whole novel must have been written per act, I would say, in in dialogue. And I reckon that there is, because of the dialogue options within the game, there is probably thousands of pages of dialogue that I have just not seen, which is absolutely wild to think about. It was made by three people, three art students, in fact, which you can tell almost immediately when (laughs) playing the game, Jake Elliott, Tamas Kamansky, and Ben Babbitt. So far as I am aware, the entire five acts of the game were just made by these three people. So that's probably what took them so long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> to give them their due, that is exactly what yeah, it is. Yeah, that is exactly and what one, it is. And one of them was not really a game designer to begin with. Ben Babbitt was a musician who got involved and then I think started learning the parts of development as he went along. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a remarkable thing to have experienced I must admit, it is much less of a point-and-click adventure game than I thought it was going to be, Mm. and is much more of a virtual novel than I thought it was going to be. There is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of reading in this. In fact, it's almost all you do. I would also struggle to say that I played Kentucky Route Zero. I almost feel as if I had Kentucky Route Zero happen to me. Yep. I feel as if I was almost like an observer to the characters in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think that the game 
quite deliberately tries to make you feel that way. Like you're not inhabiting the characters, you are observing the characters. In a similar way as you would be in a play, as if you were watching a play, you are at the theatre, you are being a participant in the play, but you are not part of the play. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know what you're saying there. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many moments in this, to me, that it feels as if you are watching a play, including the bit where you actually are watching a play. Interestingly, that bit, you're also in a play. And you're also in a play. <laughs> you can see the levels that we're dealing with here just immediately off the bat. Um, and a lot of the time, it did feel like an art exhibition, including the time you were actually in looking at an art exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what what were your thoughts initially? I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head with quite a lot of that. I th- we should probably also say that this is going to be very spoilery because it's not really possible to talk about this game at all without getting a bit spoilery, right? Yeah, having also said that is that the game is so surreal and oblique that some spoilers you might not even realise are Well, happening. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we might even disagree on what they are. I completely adored this game. It is absolutely... Absolutely. I only finished it sort of last night, actually. I finished chapter yeah, five you last, missed night. Me last night. I'd yeah. sort of been playing it steadily across a week. I didn't want to rush it because I was very conscious going in that um, some people had played this game over seven years and that they would have had an experience that we simply could not have replicated even in a month. And so, yeah, I, w- I wanted to, as much as possible, give each act and each interlude like a little bit of breathing space to let it sit and, and kind of sink into my head. I, yeah, so just when you're mentioning the yeah, yeah. words there, we should, we should also point yeah, out yeah, that the, structure, the yeah. game is broke down into five acts as a play would be Mm -hmm. and between each act there is also an interlude so during the staggered release of the game one act and one interlude would have been released at a time however since the game finished at the end of january just passed they have now released what's called the tv version which has everything in it Mm -hmm. so uh, there is act one an interlude act two an interlude and then so on on. yeah including one after act five which including one after act might not realize until you get there but yeah i I think that this is one of the most interesting, most inventive, most beautifully written games I've ever come across. I totally agree. Like the word game is an interesting word to apply to this. It feels like a piece of art. It feels like a piece of immersive art. Before everyone who is only interested in kind of quote unquote standard games turns this off, like there are elements of interaction, absolutely. And you you do inhabit the, the characters, particularly Conway, who's kind of the lead character from the beginning, and Shannon, who's kind of the other lead character as the game uh, goes on through the X. You control them, you do choose elements of their dialogue, but it's really important to stress that it's not a game that ever gives you the impression that your dialogue choices are affecting the story. They're simply kind of affecting how the story is told to you or what it feels like. That is exactly what I've written down, man. That is remarkable that you've just said that. (laughs) What I was going to say is that your choices don't matter in where the story is going. Your choices only matter in the way that the story is told. And in actual fact, I'm going to quote Alec Meir from Rock Paper Shotgun, who actually said that it's not a game about choice of action, but choice of behavior. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really well put. Yeah. Actually, I think that's really concisely and well put. It's not to do with where the story is going, because regardless of what you choose, you're going to be told the exact same story. But how that story is told to you will be will be different, not necessarily radically no, different, no. but different enough and different as if you feel as if you i don't know you just feel as if you relate to the characters better because they are behaving in the way that you expect them to because you kind of chose the way that they were going to behave in that moment yeah yeah so like a a great example of this and one i thought one of the most affecting moments in the whole game and we keep calling it a game and it's sort of five games it's also sort of 10 games almost because yeah. it's also almost not a game, not at, a game all. at all yeah <laughs> it's the worst but oh, i think God. it's in act three we are fully aware of how <laughs> wank we sound right now as well by it's, the way it's just a very difficult game to talk about it but. really is it's because it is like nothing i have ever no. experienced before no. in video games and and every part of it is so so different so i mean every part kind of i it's hard to know where to start, but when I got to the chapter five, or when I got to the end of chapter five, which was the one that I thought was weakest, actually, I thought act five, particularly... The I way, agree, the, actually. Particularly the way you actually physically interact with it. Parts of Kentucky Route Zero that I enjoyed the most were when it's at its tightest, when the story that you're being told, you're very much like in the channel of it. There's not too much road to veer away from. And suddenly the way that you control effectively a cat and some sort of insect in chapter yeah. in act five and it's in this like much more 3d kind of uh, circular World. space yeah. um, so so a lot of the scenes that you are shown are static mm-hmm. and it's you moving back and forward within a static environment yeah 2d whereas in, yeah, yeah two, exactly but act five is like a 360 environment where you can run around the whole yep. area I, I hope that makes sense to everyone like so your camera's locked in the middle of the circle and you can run around in, yeah in a big and circle. kind of follow it but right, that yeah. i think is perfectly 
emblematic of what the game's trying to go for as well and that you are controlling an insect which a cat follows around mm-hmm. and it's the cat that interacts with people mm-hmm. it's not you that interacts with people because you are controlling yeah. the the insect and that is very much what the whole game sort of feels like it feels as if you are almost suggesting what these people might do but mm-hmm. in actual fact you're just there watching you're just an observer yeah and that has been your role as the player all the way through um, and also at that point you've graduated from having sort of one playable character to having a small kind of band of playable characters through the middle section of the game yeah, yeah. to the to this point where you've effectively graduated from having that band of players or, or characters that you've been following the whole time you're sort of a an external observer again within the space yeah. and you yeah you're almost like twice removed yeah point, exactly yeah. and you're kind of watching just like I th- the more i think about act five the more affecting i find that i still didn't actually enjoy playing it as much as i did earlier parts but i think that its message and its tone the fact that you're sort of slowly letting these people go from from you that you've been i mean for some people as i say who have been following this for seven years these characters really mean something and the last moment i thought of act five was absolutely remarkable completely remarkable heartbreaking and beautiful i think i think that we almost have to say what the game is sort of about okay as well here because you (laughs) you start the game off arriving at a petrol station or a gas station because it's in america and an old shitty truck playing as conway and all Conway wants to do is make his last delivery, although you don't find that out for a while, but mm. it's his last delivery of old antiques to five dogwood drive. And that's that's it. Yep. And the only way to get there is on the mysterious Kentucky Route Zero. And the whole game leads up to, to that moment. And it is unbelievably moving mm-hmm. when it gets to the end in a way that I can't really, <laughs> can't really <laughs> describe why. But it was it was a highly, highly emotional moment when eventually that finished. And again, I only played it over the course of a week. Mm. So I can't imagine what someone who played it over the course of seven years thought of that moment and the kind of final goodbye to all these characters. And almost everything that I've read about this as well, any sort of critique mm. of this game, almost every single time being mentioned that, oh, well, it's like David Lynch. It's, <laughs> it's, it's this uh, Americana surrealist yep. world that you're in. This this has a sort of magical realism about it. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, you are. (laughs) Well, well, I mean, I mean, you are. Well, I suppose I want to ask you two things. One, Mm. you're you're a big fan of David Lynch and his work and his art, and you have an English lit degree that I don't know what it does. Probably (laughs) helps me talk about this game. (laughs) Yeah, sits on a shelf collecting dust somewhere. But no, but one one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is that I thought that the actual writing of the prose was fucking incredible. The actual standard of the writing. Yeah, I could not agree more. So the the Lynch comparison is totally valid, and particularly in the first chapter, like it's re- it's really there. And it's if you're the kind of person who's ever looked at Twin Peaks or or any of his work and kind of been like, this is weird, and I don't think it's going to be resolved, then this might really not be a game for you. Yeah. But it doesn't you, have a very satisfying ending, despite the fact that we were just talking about how moving the ending yeah. was. It's not a satisfactory it, conclusion because, to what be, has happened. Yeah, because it's not <laughs> it's not trying to tell as a story like that necessarily. And it's, and so yeah, to reel back to the writing itself, like the individual, like the line by line writing i think is amazing and so so interesting it draws you in further and further into the mysteries of this world i mean we've barely said anything about what's going on in this game but you know there are secret highways there's an underground river there's all sorts of crazy characters along the way all going through different things part of the team that you essentially build uh, along the way you know they all have interesting issues going on they've all got strange relationships with one another and with their pasts it's such a literary game like obviously you sort of mentioned my background there like if you are interested in reading at all if you're interested it's, it's definitely a magic realist story it's got kind of elements of like Borges and Marquez within it um, it's also very much like a game that is talking about other art forms I mean, we've mentioned it so much of it is like a play so much of it happens literally in the round of a play yeah yeah uh, i mean it's broken into acts like a play yeah it has literal intermissions yeah. like a play there's a bit in it that is literally a play <laughs> literally a play but it's like a play that is kind of set within the game world it like it's so dense it's so textured it's so richly kind of elusive there's like references to waiting for Godot at one point there's references to robert frost towards the end like yeah there's all sorts of like and don't get me wrong like you don't have to know any of that stuff yeah, to, yeah. to I, I, get I, I, anything all, out of all this all of that yeah. is very highfalutin and whatever like you don't have no, to it's, it, that's, it, none of that is necessarily and it's not, important it never puts it straight in your face all I, all I mean that, to say by bringing that up is that it's like it's so 
it knows what it's trying to say and it knows how to go about doing it. It's not an art game that's like looks quite nice and, you know, gets away with some mechanical stuff because it's like telling an interesting story. Like this is a proper piece of like literary fiction. Yeah, that's that's what it felt like to me a lot of the time because although I said that it felt like looking at an art exhibition and it felt like watching a play, mm. because of the volume of reading that you have to do, it, it often felt like reading a novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the way that you read a novel, you personify characters in a certain way. You relate to characters differently, which is why which is why I said when we first started talking about this, I would struggle to describe my interaction with Kentucky Route Zero as having played Kentucky Route Zero. Because, I don't know, I feel to have played a game as if I had any agency in mm-hmm. what was happening. Yeah. But in actual fact, apart from literally moving the story forward which is all you do, like all, all your interactions with the game is simply to move the story on to the next mm-hmm. thing and the next line and then the next act eventually. And that's all you do is just move the story forward. But you don't actually have any agency in what is happening most of the time. And I know that that might sound very strange to people who are listening and just said, well, you just spoke about dialogue choices. Yeah. But as we were saying as well, that doesn't really matter in terms of where the story is going. It's just how the story is being told. This is the first game that I think I've ever d- really struggled to describe as playing a game, and the the term like interactive experience, like is probably yeah. more accurate. Although it sounds even fucking worse. <laughs> I mean, I know that we are sounding like absolute wankers right now as it is, but to call this anything an interactive experience, I think it's just yeah, like, terrible. It's, an, it's a nasty phrase. <laughs> yeah. But that is honestly what it felt like. Yeah. It, it didn't. At no point did I really feel as if I was playing a game. <laughs> No, I mean, it just cannot feel like that. Like you say, it is is largely like reading something, like reading the script of a play that continually unfolds. The thing about it that makes it an interesting game or quote-unquote interactive experience, if we are going to lean into that, I really love the way that each evolving chapter you can tell how they went through stages of development and growth themselves at, over this course oh, of seven yeah, years yeah. from from act one to act five you can clearly see that they've got oh shit we've actually got some money to do something yeah interesting. they've got money but they've also like they haven't just done the same idea the same gameplay structure five times in a row and no, just, no, and just has, done a new it's, story it's been very nicely tweaked uh, yeah everything each, and you can feel it as well exactly as movement, yeah. e- each act kind of brings out new ideas and how the dialogue choices work for example or they introduce new ways to navigate the world that you're in i actually thought that the interludes were in places better than the the main game well i i thought that in particular the one that we were talking about there was a play yeah. that you were basically the entertainment yeah the entertainment yeah. is what the interlude was called you were in the play like you were part of the play you were on stage with the rest of the characters the, the rest of the characters also being part of the actual game mm-hmm. Um, but you were in a theatre and you were just supposed to be, again, an observer to the rest of the character interaction that was going on. But at the same time, you could read like critiques of the play, yep. which was obviously them, the developers themselves. So it got very meta yep. as well, because it was obviously the critiques of the developers themselves talking about their game. Oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> and you get that so much as well in uh, the section of the game where they're in the Hall of the Mountain King and you are playing the Xanadu computer project thing. Yeah, oh God, that which was so is bizarre. another well. literary reference to Coleridge. And it's yes, like... Yes. It's yes. so much there that is about... You know, I had to look that up. I, like, I, knew, <laughs> I know this is from something. I know this is from something. <laughs> it's, you know, that, that part of the game is so much... Uh, cardboard computer, the developers, talking about making this game and, and being in the middle of what turned out to be a seven-year cycle essentially that part of the game is more or less the midway point and you can tell that that's people going like we tried to set out and make this thing and fucking hell it's been awful at times and it's been amazing at times and we have grown and we've lost people and and all of these things that i'm saying now also feed so much into the rest of the game it is a game about loss it's a game about we've said nothing about the fact that it's totally about the corporate assault on the working man which is a huge part and, and how well, yeah. late american capitalism is destroying lives well that that is what it's about and again but it's only i was going to say it's obliquely referenced but it's not it's actually quite directly yeah. referenced se- at several points but most of the time it's just this overarching pressure on everyone and on on the world that you're living in is that this was an energy company isn't it yep um is effectively monopolized this section of the country that that you're supposed to be operating in it's just about the abuse of capitalism on on the american people and in this section of fictional kentucky 
a lot of it really set the tone mm. i feel oh you understand this world that you're living in and everyone's talking about debts and oh they can't turn on their lights because of the energy company and then i'll be in debt then you see all these people from the energy company who are literal skeletons who are who've been so dehumanized to just be a literal walking skeleton um glowing walking skeleton mm. because it's an energy company obviously that they are like pushing you to oh we'll take on your debt or you can consolidate over here yeah. and it's just like god this is it was it really set a very very bleak very very sad yeah tone it's a tragedy it, for it, sure, it, oh, yeah. it is 100 yeah. percent tragedy. And, and conway's story in particular when i realized that he had left with the skeletons and the towards the end of act four yeah right at the end of act four so the main character that you start out the game just is gone now just chooses to depart and just there's yeah. like this wee moment where well uh, you don't really know if he chooses to depart or if he has been taken and yeah. in actual fact that is one of the few choices that you get to make in the dialogue yeah yeah <laughs> well that that is true yeah like how you set up that whether that was a decision yeah. or not i guess i but, thought but of again, it as a choice because he sort of waves but it's it's that it's like at the time that it happened i didn't even kind of fully understand what was happening and then it was just like a minute or two later you're given that dialogue option and i just sat there for a minute with a handset and you know the controller in my hand thinking like oh fuck like that's what's happened here and this is how this is going to unfold you know the whole of act five i don't know about you but i was expecting some sort of redemption Mm -hmm. some sort of return to conway's story but no he's just been consumed by the machine yeah you know what i mean and and that's that and that was the end of his story was at the end of act four and the entirety of Act 5 takes place with without what you thought was your leading man, mm-hmm. you know? It was an incredible thing to put in this horrible capitalist, extreme capitalist, rampant capitalism um, into their game. And just to show what, what, the, what the kind of end result to that is if you like push it to this extreme. And how all these things, capitalism naturally uh, leads to monopolization and one person running your entire life. But at the end, to get back to the end, because mm-hmm. the end is something, it's something, all right, it's yeah. something quite r- remarkable. And I don't know whether we should actually spoil the end, because I know that we're doing like a spoiler mm-hmm. thing, and I know that we've spoiled a huge amount of this. But I don't know. There was something about the ending of that that felt really quite special mm-hmm. for some reason. Mm-hmm. And as you said, I actually thought chapter five was the weakest chapter, and I'd, I would completely agree with you. Um, but despite that, like, I have I have looked at a lot of art in my life, right? I've been to art galleries, I've seen art, right? I've been emotionally moved show by off. art. And I'm show <laughs> off, right? Um however, like it's it's sometimes difficult to articulate why you look at a painting and why you think, God, that is really sad or oh my god, that is that is really uplifting. I don't know if I just lack the vocabulary, but I think that in for most people it is sometimes quite difficult to understand why looking at a piece of art like that can change your emotional state and i found that at the end of kentucky route zero that i was experiencing something quite special like that experiencing something that was truly truly art like in in the, in the most tangible possible way you know i was very very emotional about it and i was quite sad about it but in a sort of kind of happy tears sort of way <laughs> and i can't really explain why I felt that way at the end, but I felt that that was one of the most artistic things that I've ever seen in the video game. Totally, yeah. It's it's extremely bittersweet, that ending. And, and I don't think we do need to say too much about what actually happens in it. You know, if you have any interest in playing this game, you should go through and experience it. Hopefully you have played it or you have had chunks of it spoiled here. But yeah, that, that ending... Can I just say, see how much we've spoiled of it? is actually very it's, minimal, it's minimal. I feel. And, and it's, in certain ways it doesn't really matter right because you know as you say it's going yeah. to play out in the same way but yeah to come back to that end and it's so kind of bittersweet it, it, i mean the music in that section alone is yeah. absolutely gorgeous all the, of this, the, mu- the music throughout the game it's is great incredible the music i was actually really, really listening good. to it all day today on spotify you really the whole oh, thing I, yeah, I was like <laughs> we were doing this big office tidy up and i just w- wanted that in my ears the whole time wow. it's gorgeous and so all just all of those things combine and they do like combine really really well right at the end to give you that lasting kind of final moment i do wonder whether if that played a part in you not playing any games yeah. since then it's interesting well, that you I'm, took a break i'm not going to lie to you like i feel as if there has been a lot of emotional weight in the games yeah. that i've played yeah, recently. Yeah, like yeah. not not so much doom but like before that was <laughs> the, the last of us but then before that was also death stranding and i felt as if there was a lot like my, my mood at the time as well was just kind of like yeah let's just let's just step away from this a little bit but yeah i mean it has resonated with me massively like i have thought about that moment quite a lot yeah. since actually experiencing it i don't think that there might be a better case for how 
video games can be art no. than this game. No, absolutely it is, not. It is the height of prose, like we were saying. So things like symbolism is absolutely incredible. The, the world that it creates, the tones that are created within the game are just unbelievable. And, th- and the way that it's done is just so precise. Like, it know, as you said, it just knows exactly what it's trying to do. And it really, really accomplishes it yeah. every single time. And it does it in not a traditional video game way. It doesn't do it through gameplay. You know what I mean? That That's basically what I'm trying to get at here is that this game accomplishes all this not through gameplay, but actually through rather traditional means mm-hmm. in writing and in, in the prose and whatever, rather than in the gameplay. I, I do a little bit almost wish that it had a little bit more gameplay. Like I do sort of wish that so that I could say, yeah, this is definitely a game. It's not <laughs> It's not an art project. This is definitely, definitely a game, but it, it doesn't. And I just think that the way that it accomplishes what it's trying to do is just incredible. And it's unlike anything I've ever experienced. And I think that to be honest with you, it'll probably never be done again because it was three people sat in a room mm. who had a very high understanding of the arts, obviously because yeah, they yeah. were art students. <laughs> And they were lucky enough to have the time to be able to do it at their own pace correctly. Yeah. And I and, mean, I mean and, hats off to them. Yeah. Man. And they got a, a good patient fan base behind them as well that were willing to support the game in the way that it was developing and would go along for the ride of it all. It would have been so easy and so typical of the games industry for people to be like, I'm not waiting another year for the next chapter. Like, screw this. And yeah. it's just like, it's ticked along. They've got to this end point. It's finally come to consoles. I cannot. Honestly, I cannot recommend playing it highly enough. It's not going to be for everyone. It's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely see, not going to be. That's what I was going to come on to. I was like, I'm not sure how many people I could recommend play it because, as I said, you're not really playing anything. Yeah, but that, I think it just it really depends what you're looking for in your games. Yeah. Like, if it really matters to you that it's all you know, it's all shooting or it's all combat or yeah, that there's strategy it's, it's, and it's, puzzles it's, it's, and all that. Action, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's just something that you have to be. Yeah. Doing. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. No, absolutely not. And it's like, yeah, obviously most games are about strategizing to get to an endpoint right yeah. whatever means you then do that this isn't that but it is completely remarkable and i i am definitely going to play it again maybe yeah, to, maybe to honest, very soon to, to but be honest with you I'm probably yeah going to play it again. just to to experience it to kind of get it all it's because so much of it echoes throughout the rest of the game there are names that keep coming up there are ideas and people and places that get mentioned again and again and again and it would be so interesting to go back having now completed it to just kind of try and unpick that. And that's like what I've done with Twin Peaks as well. I just yeah. like watch it repeatedly to kind of see where the, <laughs> what the constellations are. So uh, yeah, it's certainly not going to be for everyone. Maybe if you've not played it, go and check out like the first 10 minutes on YouTube or something, just kind of get a sense of it. It won't do it anywhere near justice. I, know, I, but, I, I honestly think, man, I don't know how you could watch. Like even if I watched it be played, I'm not really sure that that, that is the same thing. It's not the same thing, which is interesting because that turns it back into a game stroke interactive experience right? because <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should yeah, feel it the same watching it but it is your choices and that's what I was going to say earlier was just the section where um, Junebug is doing her first performance and you're picking Man, the lines of the song that is that, that is my favourite moment in the game it's now. like an that utterly incredible moment yeah. and to feed back into everything that we've said like that song is going to be sung and, it's, and it is a real song and it has been recorded in a certain way you don't have to sing it like that but you're just picking certain lines certain phrases that they then react to and you construct the song that you think that those characters would be singing to us. So there's, there is agency within it and there is gameplay within it, but it is also still, you can't change it into a very happy song about something else because it's not that it is like a somber song about something in particular. And so like that maybe sums everything up. It's like, that is how you engage with it. And I think that that is just utterly incredible what they were able to achieve with that system. It really is. It really is something special. But Lewis, I have to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars wherever you get your podcasts, that's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever you get your podcasts. If you could rate and review us, we would really, really appreciate that. And thank you so, so much to anyone that's already done that for us. You are an absolute legend to us. I suppose we have to now announce our next game list, which will be Her Story from Sam Barlow. So this is another sort of interactive film video game thing weirdness that I've certainly been looking forward to playing definitely, for a definitely. long, long time. Came out in 2015, I think. Yeah, June, mm-hmm. June 2015. So yeah, really looking forward to playing that. And also, I'm going to announce our game for April as well, which will be Telling Lies, which is also the second solo game by Sam Barlow, which will be 
um, which is the spiritual successor yeah. to her story. The reason why I'm saying this is because we, we want to do a little bit of a chat about Sam Barlow as well throughout these two games. And the last time that we tried to do this about... Uh, Play Dead, who of course had done Limbo and Inside, which we done back to back, and I just realised that there might have been deals on those two games that folk could have got together, and if they were trying to play along with us, and then they bought Limbo, and then they decided, oh well, I've spent all that money in Limbo, and then I don't want to then spend on Inside when in actual fact they could have probably bought them both yeah. together for a lot cheaper. So it's just in case there is any other deals yeah, out there, well, we're going to do these the, both these games back to back. They are both uh, on Steam together for twenty pounds at Bang. the moment. Yeah, there we go. so it's there like a ten percent reduction on what you would pay otherwise. But um, her story itself is obviously a bit cheaper it's a bit older so yeah but they're both coming up yes back to back sam barlow let's get stuck in it and we'll see you next time ladies and gentlemen thanks